Hello, my beautiful friends. I am Laurel Bleedin Maffei with Illuminating Souls, welcoming you to this episode of Sleepy Bedtime Blessings, a podcast designed to help you rest, relax, and fall asleep, all while deepening in your connection with your beautiful team of angels who love you so. If we're meeting for the first time, I am an angelic practitioner, a spiritual teacher, and an encourager of souls. And I do this through one-on-one angel sessions, soul mentoring, and a variety of classes designed to inspire your spirit. And you can learn more about my offerings at my website, illuminatingsouls.com. But for now, the angels and I are here to help you come in to a good expanse of rest. So I am someone who listens to sleep podcasts every night and have been doing so for many years now. And I love the genre so much. I was guided to create this for you. And this, this program blends together two of my favorite forms of self-care, angels and sleep podcasts. <laughs> so if you're new to the world of sleep podcasts, here are my suggestions for you. It may take a few nights of listening to get used to the rhythm of my voice and get used to sort of the ramblings that take place here. Each episode runs about an hour because I find as a listener, I prefer longer podcasts. If a podcast is only 20 or 30 minutes long, I feel pressure to go to sleep right away. And I find that I need a bit of time before I actually drift off. So each episode runs about an hour. There's two components to the episode. The first is the one that you're listening to right now where I welcome you to the space. And then I usually share with you some kind of spiritual inspiration and I bring the angels in. The angels are already here. They are here from the first moment, but I say a prayer so that you know they are here as well. And then the second part of the podcast, I usually will tell you a story. It might be a story from my own life. Or I might read you a story, something that is already in public domain. Sometimes I blend the two together. But the content I bring to you is designed to be rambling and slow and sweet and created in such a way that it allows your consciousness to have a focal point so that it's easier for it to drift off. So rather than your mind racing through the events of the day, instead you can focus on my voice and whatever it is I'm sharing with you. And this is what I have found to be so amazing about my own experience as a listener of sleep podcasts is that it really helps me fall asleep. So here we are. Another tip I'll share with you is that most podcast apps, I use Apple's podcast app that comes with the phone. They have sleep timers. So I use the sleep timer and I tell the podcast app, to shut off after the episode ends. So this makes sure I will not wake up in the middle of the night to 
random conversation on my phone from other podcasts. I will also say that I I know from different sleep podcast communities that some people set up a playlist that runs all night and that helps them. And this is our 76th episode, so plenty of episodes to choose from that you can listen to all night if you choose to do that as well. I also find it helpful to turn the volume down low, lower than I might if I'm listening to a program that I really want to pay attention to. So I turn the podcast down low so that it sounds more like a bedtime story right? That beautiful archetypal story that so many of us grew up with, where you're cozied up in bed and you hear a loving and soothing voice gently speaking to you as you get ready to drift off into sleep. That's what I'm here for right now. So I invite you to take a nice deep breath in and release And allow your body to relax, to cozy on in and snuggle on up, getting underneath your blankets just so and fluffing the pillows. I'm somebody who sleeps with a lot of blankets and pillows. So there's this cocoon of softness that I crawl into when I get ready for bed. We all have our own way of getting ready for bed. So whatever yours is, just get yourself all nice and cozy. I will share with you as I record this, the energy is really sweet. I just keep wanting to take deep breaths and just be in this energy field with you. It really does feel like a cocoon of love, a bubble of love that is here for each one of us listening in this moment. So I'll tell you what, I'm going to call the angels in. The angels are celestial beings who embody divine love. They are non-denominational, not associated with any religious path. I mean, they could be associated through some people's eyes, but I experience them as universal. And I'm going to call them in now so that you know they are here as well. So beautiful angels on high, I ask that you join us here and I acknowledge that you are already here and have been here all along. I ask that you fill this broadcast with waves of love and service to all who are listening to this message whether they hear this message in a matter of days or they hear this message years later, that your love is just as present as it is in this moment. Angels, I ask that you bring healing to each of our beloveds hearing this message that in this moment we need not know what is up for healing because God knows. Angels, I ask that you bring forward light. I ask that you bring forward calming and soothing energies compatible with a good night's sleep or a good day's sleep, whatever time of the day it is as each of you are seeking to rest. And angels, I ask that you cleanse and clear our energy fields 
of anything that does not belong to us, anything that no longer serves. And as we did in our last episode, I ask that you help us connect, help imbue us with a beautiful lightness of spirit. I affirm that inspiration is flowing to each of us now. Light is flowing in. And dear ones, I invite you to just breathe in this field of love that is being created just for you. That as you rest, the angels will help to balance your energy field. They will help to bring you blessings of light to support you on your path. You are such a bright and beautiful soul. You are a blessing here on earth. Your life is a gift to all who get to love you. So just allow yourself to receive the love of the angels. You know, one of the first things that often comes forward when I help people connect with the angels is this concept of receiving love. As lightworkers, as bringers of light, whatever term you want to use for it. We are often so good at giving love, at loving others, having empathy and compassion for others. But often our receiving muscle is a bit atrophied because we don't use it as often. Because so much of our beingness is based upon shining the light and bringing the love. But it is important that we receive as well. Otherwise, we get depleted. So this is your opportunity to recharge and restore your light battery that you are worthy of big, beautiful love, just as you are. But there's nothing about you that needs to be fixed or transformed before you are worthy of love. You are worthy of love in this breath and in the next. There's a visualization that I love that the angels bring forward and just imagine, visualize, allow it to be so. That your angels are standing before you. And one of your angels holds out their hand and places it in front of your heart chakra and infuses your heart chakra with love from their heart to yours. And just allow this love to flow to you, to fill your heart. This love is coming from an angel who has known you since before you were born. They know the truth of your beingness. They know the truth of your greater soul. And they know the truth of your personality self that you are embodied in right now. And they love you. They have such compassion and respect for your journey here on earth. It is not easy to be in the midst of an incarnation. We go through the portal of amnesia and we forget who we are. 
It can feel that way sometimes, right? When I went to USM, they would use the adage that is very popular, so they did not coin it. You are a spiritual being having a human experience. And I will tell you, there are times that I am aware that I am a spiritual being having a very, very, very human experience. <laughs> when I am all earth girl, and I have forgotten my divinity completely. I've shared before that often when I am in the weeds, <laughs> when I am in a oh, place of overwhelm or sadness or disappointment or whatever, that earthy, dense, emotional material is that we all frequent from time to time. I will talk to my husband about it. And almost always his response is, have you talked to your friends yet? And that is code for, have I talked to the angels about this yet? My answer is always no, because when I'm in that place, I forget all about angels, <laughs> which really sounds weird because this is what I do for a living, right? This is my career. But I too forget. I too forget that this love is always here. It's natural to forget. You know, this incarnation is about each of our own personal journeys. It's not about being in constant telephone contact with non-physical beings. But it's good to remember that they're here supporting us. So whenever my husband tells me that, I sheepishly say, no, no, <laughs> of course I haven't yet. And it's that reminder to just take a break, take a pause, say a prayer. Ask the angels for help. Shift my perspective. Try to get up above the cloud level to the 50,000 foot level is what I call it. So I can gain some perspective to make space for a shift to take place. This just happened to me yesterday. I've been feeling rather frustrated about something. The, the details are really not important. I'm sure they would be interesting to you, but I'm not going to bring them into this conversation. And I've been feeling mm, that my experience in certain areas of my life, or I've been feeling rather confining you know, not necessarily inspiring or reflective of the vibration I seek to have. And yesterday, I just received a random email, you know, somehow we wind up on these mailing lists. And I opened an email I usually wouldn't have opened. And it contained a spark of inspiration for me. It contained something that made me take a deeper breath and go, oh, well, hey, that's interesting. And I could feel like the tumblers of a lock coming into alignment, a new possibility starting to open. And it's been almost 24 hours later and they're still opening. And that's the thing I love so much about this work is that we make space, or I make space at least, and I'm hoping you will too. We make space for a shift, these subtle shifts that come that are positive in nature, right? It's these shifts where all of a sudden, for me at least, I can see through new eyes. A new opportunity arises, a new invitation comes forth. Something that felt really heavy the day before is somehow lifted 
the next day. Like the weather. The weather's a great metaphor for this. You know, one day it's cloudy and overcast. The next day the skies are bright blue. And I think that's a great metaphor for oftentimes what we are navigating in life. So here's to the angels helping to clear and balance your energy field so that you too can connect with sparks of inspiration and lightness of spirit to help you gain altitude and feel the love, receive the love that your angels are bringing you. This is not love that requires you to do anything. You just be. You just exist. You drift off to sleep, my friend. And while you do, the angels will be with you, bringing you love and tending to you ever so gently in a way that allows your soul and spirit to blossom open. So you rest, and while you rest, I'm going to tell you a story. Okay, so... So I have a fun walk down memory lane I thought we could take together. I know that many of you who listen are based in the U.S., and we also have quite a number of you who live outside of the U.S., so wherever you're listening from, welcome. Glad you're here. We're going to be talking about the... 1977-1978 network television schedule for the U.S. I think a lot of the shows I'm going to talk about probably were syndicated internationally, so if you are not based in the U.S., I still think there will be some fun memories that come forward for you here. So I'll start off by sharing something that if you are a loyal listener, you know already that I have always loved television. You know how some people say, "Eh, I don't like TV. I don't even own a TV. Okay, that's never going to be me. I have always been a girl who loved television. This idea that this screen, this box exists and you get to watch stories and meet people through it, always enticed me. I loved television. And back in, let's say, 1977, so I would have been about 15 years old, I don't know that we even had a color television at that point. We might have, so maybe we did, but I definitely grew up with black and white television And our family was late to the world of color television. And and maybe by then we had a color TV, I seem to recall. At this point, I was still sharing a room with my sister. And I don't think we had a TV in our bedroom. And so mostly we all watched television together in our living room. So there had to be some kind of agreement between my parents and my siblings and I, on what we were going to watch. So a lot of what we watched was based on collective agreement, right? What would my parents let us watch? What were the shows that were non-negotiable? And again, this is way before the internet. So typically we would get a TV programming guide, not the TV guide that is branded as TV guide. We we did not get that um, because we would have had to pay for a subscription to that. But we would typically get a weekly TV programming guide from the city newspaper. We subscribed to both the Chicago Sun-Times and the Chicago Tribune. 
And so usually there was some sort of program guide that would be a supplement that would sit on the coffee table. And you'd look through to see what was on and what you could watch this week, what was important. So I remember we we used those guides pretty frequently. And this was the day and age before cable, at least in our house. I don't even know if cable existed at that point. So everything came over the broadcast television. And we got, I think, five or six channels. There were the three major networks, CBS, NBC, and ABC. We had two big independent stations, which was WGN, Channel 9, and WFLD, which was Channel 32, which was UHF. The others were VHF. And then we also had our public television station, Channel 11, WTTW. So limited programming, and you had to watch live because VCRs were not a thing at that point for the home. And so I thought we could go through some of the programs. So I'm pulling this up off of Wikipedia, and they start off on Sunday nights. Now the thing about Sundays was we grew up in Chicago, and in the winter, a huge part of our Sunday involved watching the Bears football games. Now, I didn't really watch football, but my dad liked it and my mom liked it. So somehow it was always on the television or else there would be some, you know, really bad, scary movie that was airing at WGN. But Sundays also typically involved fresh bagels. I'm a food girl, so all of my memories involve food somehow. Where I grew up in Skokie, there is a wonderful bagel shop called New York Bagels and Bialis. Interesting fact, that I don't know if they still are, but they used to be open 24 hours a day. So any time of the day or night, you could go and get a fresh hot bagel. And usually my father would go out on Sunday mornings and bring home fresh bagels. So Sundays usually involved fresh bagels. Um, Bears games. I would usually read a book or something, I'm sure. And, um, and 60 Minutes. This is where I blended into television. Our house was a 60 Minutes family. So 60 Minutes was on, and that would be what we were watching. Now, as I look at the schedule, though, here's the thing. What was also on was the Hardy Boys Nancy Drew Mysteries. Now, I had a big crush on Sean Cassidy at this point. So I know I was watching this. I don't know if I watched it on the television in the basement because my parents weren't going to miss 60 minutes. So somehow I was watching the Hardy Boys. And what would happen is the Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew would alternate weeks. So I didn't really care about Nancy Drew. Like, come on. Um, I was into the two cute boys, Sean Cassidy and Parker Stevenson, who were the stars of the Hardy Boys. So, and I didn't care about 60 Minutes. I was 15 years old. That was boring to me. What was also airing around at the same time slot was The Wonderful World of Disney, which I don't really recall. I know I watched it at times, but... I'm sure that nothing would hold a candle to the Hardy Boys as far as I was concerned. So I'm sure I watched the Hardy Boys. On the um, 8 o'clock slot, which actually would have been 7 o'clock in Chicago because our schedule was an hour behind everybody else's, we would likely have been watching The Six Million Dollar Man I mean, what was not to love about Lee Majors and the Six Million Dollar Man? I can still hear the sound effects, right, when his bionics would kick in. (laughs) But what was airing opposite of Six Million Dollar Man was Rhoda with Valerie Harper, which was a spinoff 
of Mary Tyler Moore. Okay, here's a here's a trivia. Who remembers Carlton the Tour Man from Rhoda? <laughs> that was funny. Um, he would always buzz her apartment and go, this is Carlton, the doorman. He would identify himself every time and it became a running joke. And then there's a show called On Our Own that I don't remember at all. And then came All in the Family, which was required viewing, really. It was such a popular relevant show and we definitely watched all in the family and that was followed by alice um which was another sitcom and then for the later time slot i'm looking here it's interesting cbs you know they would have shows that would air in the fall and then shows that would air you know after january so they sort of split up the time slot so it says that they showed Kojak with Telly Savalas, which we definitely watched. The Carol Burnett Show, which of course we watched. Everybody watched that. Dallas, uh, well, yeah, for sure, watched Dallas. And then Switch, which I, I remembered and I had to look up. And it was a detective show with Eddie Albert and Robert Wagner. I believe, which I know we watched because my mom liked Robert Wagner. <laughs> so that was Sunday. So Sundays, my memory of Sundays involved bagels, Bears games. I would usually probably read a book because I thought the Bears were boring because um, I didn't know then at that point that I would come to appreciate football later in life. Um, 60 Minutes, I would go to Hardy Boys with my sister. And then, you know, some probably some sitcom and then whatever CBS was going to be airing at the 10 o'clock slot, which would be 11, uh, yeah, the 10 o'clock slot. It would be nine o'clock in Chicago, but 10 o'clock if you were on the East or West coast, not to sound too confusing here. Okay. So now we come to Mondays. Now it's interesting. I don't really remember what we were watching in the early slot on Mondays, but let me give you a rundown of what was airing. Something called the San Pedro Beach Bums, which I promise you have never seen. I have no idea what that is. ABC also showed something called Lucan, which I seem to remember was about a wolf boy. I think. I'm not even going to look it up. I think it was Lucan the wolf boy, which sounds like something I would have watched. Um, but also Six Million Dollar Man, which for sure I watched. I don't, I don't know. That was the Six Million Dollar Man and the Six Million Dollar Woman. Or by, oh, it was the Bionic Woman, I think, that I watched. Because airing opposite of it was Young Daniel Boone, which you couldn't have paid me to watch. This was definitely not my programming. Logan's Run, which I was not a sci-fi person at that point in time. And then it also looks like Good Times and the Jeffersons also were airing at some point, which I remember watching both of those. And NBC was showing Little House on the Prairie, which I remember watching, but I wasn't devoted to it. I loved the Laura Ingalls Wilder books so much that I had a hard time making a shift to the TV program. So I watched it, but it wasn't necessarily something that I had to watch. And then at um, 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock, if you're on the East or West Coast, you would have Monday Night Football, which, again, I had no interest in, in <laughs> or baseball. And then, just like the best block ever, was M.A.S.H., and one day at a time, we definitely were a MASH household for sure. Um, loved that show. So we for sure were a MASH household watching that on Monday nights. And then in the third time slot, they had Switch. So again, they would move that show around. And Lou Grant, how many of you remember the show Lou Grant? It was so good. It was Ed Asner. 
his character after the Mary Tyler Moore show. So Lou after the Mary Tyler Moore show and where the Mary Tyler Moore show was a sitcom, Lou Grant was a drama and he was running a newspaper and it really was a great show. I, I, I can f- see it in my head and I remember really enjoying that. So that was Monday nights. Now, Tuesdays, Tuesday was a blockbuster. Must see TV was branded to somebody else, but so I'm going to borrow that. It's You had to watch on Tuesdays because Tuesdays was ABC. ABC owned Tuesdays because you had happy days, Laverne and Shirley, Three's Company, and Soap. I had to watch all of them, right? We, we definitely watched Happy Days. We watched all of them, all of them. I, I can't imagine my parents enjoying these shows, so I'm sure they were in the living room with us, or my dad would have gone down to the basement. We had I had a recliner downstairs, and my dad would often retreat to the basement to sleep um, when we were watching these kinds of shows. So um, we have Happy Days, Laverne and Shirley, Three's Company, and Soap. And, and how's this for interesting? My husband and I just started rewatching Soap. I hadn't seen it in years, and my husband started reminiscing about it. And I found it in the U.S. It's on a a streaming service called Tubi, T-U-B-I TV. It's free. It just comes with commercials. And so my husband and I have been binge watching Soap the past week, and it is hysterically funny. How many of you watched it and remember how Bert would go invisible by snapping his hands, (laughs) snapping his fingers? Or Chuck and Bob with the ventriloquist dummy. Uh, It's so funny. So we are enjoying that all over again. And then in the third time slot, ABC had Family, which was a great show. Um, The Incredible Hulk, right? Iconic, Bill Bixby. Um, And Welcome Back, Cotter, which we haven't really talked about, but that was also an iconic show for the time. And the other networks, it's interesting. So CBS had something called the Fitzpatricks, which I don't remember at all. Then they also had the Celebrity Challenge of the Sexes. (laughs) How many of you remember that? I, I just... I don't know. I have this um, vision of celebrities and leotards. I don't really remember. They also had the Shields and Yarnell show, which involved mimes. <laughs> I seem to recall there were mimes involved. Um, and the Richard Pryor show. Also rotating in the Tuesday schedule, MASH shows up at some point on CBS airing opposite of Three's Company. I assure you, we would have watched MASH. My parents would have never let us watch Three's Company over MASH. Um, One day at a time, and again with Lou Grant. The other thing that was happening on Tuesdays at some point was Man from Atlantis. Okay, who remembers that show with Patrick Duffy and the webbed webbed hands that he would have to help him swim. Um, also was Police Woman with Angie Dickinson, which I don't think we ever watched, but I would imagine was a pretty iconic show. And then some other shows here that I don't recall, so we're going to just move on to Wednesday. So here's Wednesday. So in the 8 o'clock slot... Uh, we were we would have been an ABC family at this point for for Wednesdays because we start off with Eight Is Enough, which was this wholesome, sweet show about a family with eight kids that I know I watched. Again, whether my parents would have watched with us, I don't know, but we definitely would have watched it. Um, 
and that was followed by Charlie's Angels, <laughs> which we for sure watched. Um, <laughs> I'm just laughing because it was so iconic, Charlie's Angels back then. Um, and then in the in the third time slot was Beretta with Robert Blake or Starsky and Hutch, both of which we watched. Gritty, late 70s cop shows, right? Um, that do not age well. And I remember I had a crush on Hutch and I liked the cockatoo and Beretta. So something for everyone there. <laughs> and also what was airing in on the other networks was Good Times, which I know we watched. Um, the Amazing Spider-Man, which I don't think I ever saw. And then on NBC was the life and time of Grizz, the life and times of Grizzly Adams, which I know what that show was, but we, I wouldn't have watched it. I didn't, I didn't like Westerns. Um, the Black Sheep Squadron again, which I wouldn't have watched. And Policewoman. Again, wouldn't have watched that. So that would have been Wednesdays. Wednesdays, we definitely would have been doing Eight is Enough, Charlie's Angels, and Starsky and Hutch, or Beretta, whichever one was airing. Okay, so now we get to Thursday. Again, Thursday, there's a lot happening. A lot of things to choose from. So ABC is showing Welcome Back, Cotter. John Travolta, right? It's his breakout role. We for sure were watching that. Um, and then that was followed by What's Happening, another sitcom, which I remember, and or Fish, which Fish was a spinoff with Abe Vigoda. It was a spinoff of Barney Miller, which we watched. And then that was followed by Barney Miller, which was a great cop sitcom. Um, I don't remember either of the sitcoms that followed Barney Miller, Carter Country or AES Hudson Street. So I don't remember either one of those. And then the later time slot was the Red Fox Comedy Hour, which I don't think we would have watched because that wasn't our, um, our flavor of comedy or Beretta. But here's why I don't think we were watching the Red Fox comedy show, because we would have been watching Barnaby Jones with Buddy Epson, for sure. But what was airing opposite Welcome Back Cotter was The Waltons, which was a profoundly wholesome show, which I know we watched, so I'm not quite sure what we would have chosen into. But either Welcome Back Cotter or The Waltons, um... The Waltons was followed up by Hawaii Five O, which we did not watch. I don't ever remember watching that show. And at some point, we would have tuned in to Barnaby Jones. Um, also airing on other networks at that point that we weren't really watching was Chips. How many of you remember Chips? The California Highway Patrol. Um, the Motorcycle Cops. Man from Atlantis was also airing. Um, James at 15, which I think at some point I watched a little bit of, but I wasn't really into. Now we come to Friday night. Now, Friday night, there was a lot happening. We start off with Donnie and Marie, which, of course, I watched. I loved Donnie and Marie. I'm a little bit country and I'm a little bit rock and roll. <laughs> right? And they had the ice skaters. Who remembers the ice skaters on Donnie and Marie? Raise your hand. But you're sleeping. Don't raise your hand. But you understand, right? So Donnie and Marie. And also, um, what was airing opposite of that were the new adventures of Wonder Woman, which I did not watch. I was not into those kinds of stories. So I definitely, for sure, would have been watching Donnie and Marie. Um, yeah, I don't even recognize the shows that were airing on 
NBC at that time. Okay, and then after Donnie and Marie, ABC went on to the ABC Friday Night Movie, which we may or may not have watched depending on what was airing. Also airing at that time slot was The Incredible Hulk, which again, we wouldn't have watched because, let's see, was this on a different network? No, okay, it's because NBC was showing the Rockford Files. And we were definitely a Rockford Files family. You know, my parents both liked that show. We found it entertaining. So we were definitely a Rockford Files family on Friday nights. And what came after Rockford Files on NBC was Quincy M.E. That was um, about the coroner with Jack Klugman that we absolutely watched. So... We probably went from Donnie and Marie to the Rockford Files to Quincy Emmy. And um, that would have been our Friday night viewing. Now, Saturdays, I have to tell you, Saturdays is one of the reasons I went to look at this television season. Because on Saturdays, um, it wasn't every Saturday night. But every once in a while, on a Saturday night, I would get hired to babysit the little boy across the alley. And the reason I remember it so clearly is I would watch The Love Boat, and then I would watch Fantasy Island, and his parents would always come home at some point during Fantasy Island. (laughs) So that's why I remember this. And I would go to White Hen Pantry, which was our version of 7-Eleven, because 7-Eleven wasn't in our market at that point. And I would get like three kinds of snacks. I would get some kind of chips. I would get some kind of candy. And I would get some kind of snack cake. So I might get Doritos and M&M's and snowballs, hostess snowballs or something. I would get three kinds of snacks and I would have one snack with each show. <laughs> I was I was very clear on my on my snacking um my reward. It was kind of my reward, right? It was my way of delighting myself. And my babysitting of this young boy really included nothing, just being in the house, because by the time I got there, he was always asleep. So there really wasn't anything I needed to do. Um, but, but here were the programs for my wild Saturday night. So at the eight o'clock hour, I'm not really sure what I have, would have watched. It looks like family might have been on, which I enjoyed. Um, the Bob Newhart show, which I likely would have watched, um, the Jeffersons, and now we have the Bionic Woman, which is probably what I was watching at that point. The other things that were on was the Tony Randall show, which I don't really recall, the Ted Knight show, which again, I, I don't remember watching, and Operation Petticoat, which again, I wouldn't have watched. But now we really get to the gold, the gold of the love boat. And I don't know about you, but um, who else can remember all the words to the opening song of the love boat? The love boat (laughs) soon will be making another, what was it, ride? Another ride? I don't remember. Um, Set your... (laughs) Forget it. I'm not, I'm not, wait, should I go find the words? Maybe I will. Hold on just a second. Okay. This is how devoted I am to creating quality programming for you. I found the lyrics to the Love Boat's opening theme song. I will not sing it to you though. I do not want to disturb you, but I will read to you these brilliant lyrics. Love Boat. Love, exciting and new. Come aboard, we're expecting you. 
love life's sweetest reward. Let it flow. It floats back to you. The love boat soon will be making another run. Let's run. Okay, love boat soon will be making another run. The love boat promises something for everyone. Set a course for adventure, your mind on a new romance. Love won't hurt anymore. It's an open smile on a friendly shore. (laughs) This is so deep, right? Okay. Now, oh, you know what? They're going to do the, they're going to sing the chorus again. So I won't trouble you with that, but I will, um, kind of go to the end here. It's love. It's love. It's love. It's the love boat. It's the love boat. (laughs) And that's what I would have been watching (laughs) on Saturday nights, The Love Boat, right? With like Polly Bergen and whoever, like whoever the guest would be, Fred Astaire or, um, you know, like whoever, whoever the stars were for that week, we'd be watching The Love Boat. And then that, of course, was followed by the iconic Fantasy Island, which was brilliant programming, right? It's a plane, it's a plane. <laughs> Ricardo Montalban and Harvey Villachez with their rotating cast of guest stars. You wonder what it would have been like to be an agent back then and what that meant for your career to have been offered the love boat or Fantasy Island. And you know what? I thought I would go and look up some of the episodes of The Love Boat that would have been airing that season. So, um, again, this is coming from Wikipedia. The first episode, we have Bonnie Franklin as a guest star. She is Captain Steubing's ex-wife. She's Um, on board with her new husband. Um, I'm sorry, an actor I don't recognize, Robert Simmons. Um, A former centerfold model played by Meredith Baxter. But we also have Brenda Sykes and Jimmy Walker. So, I mean, the guest stars were just always brilliant. Oh, Suzanne Summers looks like she was in this one as well. So... Episode two included John Ritter. So he is a man posing as a woman (laughs) because the only available cabin he could share was already occupied by another woman, Tova Feldshill. Let's see, we have Sherman Hemsley in this episode, Dennis Cole, who he was very handsome, and Jacqueline Smith, so a very handsome couple on that episode. So there's always somebody interesting to see. Episode three involved Robert Reed, Mr. Brady, right? Robert Reed and Loretta Swit from MASH. Oh, and then there's a story where two teens fall in love. The teens played by Christy McNichol and Scott Bayo. Brilliant casting, right? I mean, of course, this is why we were watching. In episode number, let's see, what episode? Episode number four, we've got Bill Bixby and Brenda Bennett, Milton Berle and Charo. I mean, come on, do you get more iconic than Milton Berle and Charo? And you know what? If you're not in the U.S., you may not know who some of these actors are, so I apologize in advance. We have Audra Lindley, who played Mrs. Roper on Three's Company is in that one. Episode five has Diana Carroll, who was gorgeous and, and talented. We have Jim Neighbors. And let's see who else was in that one. David Groh, Michelle Lee. In episode six, we have Ruth Gordon with Patty Duke. So Ruth Gordon is a grandmother determined to marry off her granddaughter. So Ruth Gordon is the grandmother 
and Patty Duke is the granddaughter. Maureen McCormick is in that episode, Marsha Brady. Thank you very much. In episode seven, we have Diana Canova in a dual role playing identical twins. And I remember who she is because she played Corinne on Soap, which my husband and I are currently binge rewatching. So she's in this episode. Um, Ray Bolger, he was, wasn't he the scarecrow in, um, in Wizard of Oz? And Harriet Nelson is in this episode. So there's so much to see here, right? You know, it's so funny. I'm looking now at episode number eight and you know who is in this? Polly Bergen. This is a weird, scary memory thing. Like of all the actors and all of the Love Boat episodes, how is it possible that I remembered that Polly Bergen was in an episode? Because I think, didn't I just say that earlier? That Polly Bergen was in it. Some part of me remembered Polly Bergen and I think that's really weird. She's with Steve Allen in this episode. And also Sandy Duncan and Jim Stafford are in this episode. How's this for? Oh, oh, Lonnie Anderson was in this one. So this is why I would have been watching. In the next episode, we've got Jane Curtin from SNL, right? Phil Silvers. Gary Berghoff from MASH. This is just no wonder I was watching, right? Wait, let's take a look at Fantasy Island. You want to know who was at Fantasy Island that year? Hold on. Just so you know, there's more episodes. I'm just not going to read all of them. Oh, wait, I have to. Because in episode 10, Ava Gabor is in this. And Leslie Nielsen. Like, that's just brilliant. Robert Urich, who I always thought was so handsome, was in that episode as well. So always something to see. So... Let's look at Fantasy Island. So it looks like the first episode had Bert Convy, who who was on a lot of variety shows at that point, Diana Canova, again, who was on Soap, and Georgia Engel, who was on the Mary Tyler Moore show. And let's see, I'm looking for some of the the um the names I recognize. Okay, it's weird that I remember him. Dak Rambo. He was a very handsome actor. He may have been on a soap at some point. Ed Begley Jr. Lisa Hartman. Another episode with Juliet Mills. They may have had trouble getting the actors on this. It doesn't seem like they had the range of actors in the first season that they did on The Love Boat. I'm not as excited about who I'm finding here. Don Knotts did an episode, Ray Bolger, Lucy Arnaz, (laughs) Rich Little. You know, what's really scary is I can't believe I remember who all these people are. Richard Dawson, David Burney, Artie Johnson, Sonny Bono. Just brilliant television. So that would have been my Saturday night. The Love Boat and Fantasy Island and Snacks. I was a wild child back then. And so that was the 1977-78 U.S. Network Television Schedule. (laughs) A little snapshot from my life back then. I just love television and would then go on to try and make that my career. So lots of great memories there. And hopefully this was interesting enough that if you were awake, maybe you're laughing with me, and if not, maybe you're asleep already, which would be even better if somehow these ramblings and these walks down memory lane helped put you to sleep. So thank you for allowing me the blessing of spending this time with you and sharing some memories with you. What TV programs did you grow up watching? What do you remember? 
I love how these memories are sort of compartmentalized in my consciousness somewhere that I can draw upon them and they bring me amusement and some joy that I hopefully get to share with you then. So, my beautiful beloveds, I wish you sweet dreams. I wish you a wonderful rest and an infusion of inspiration and lightness of spirit. So you rest well, the angels will be with you. And if you're craving more company, you can queue up another episode. There's a lot of them in the archive. So I send you love. And I am deeply, deeply grateful for the opportunity to spend this time with you. We'll talk again soon. Good night.